Um, so welcome everyone. Thanks for, for coming along. Um, I know we've got people joining us from, from France and Malta today, so uh, that's, that's great. Uh, this is the second run of a, a seminar we did originally for the Association of Heritage Interpreters, which uh, proved very popular. We had 70 people turned up, so uh, we thought we'd uh, rerun it uh, and just uh, aim it more at people outside the sort of professional heritage interpretation business. Um, just to run through the things there, I think we're going to take about an hour uh, in total. So I'm going to try and finish in well under the hour to leave enough time for some Q&A. Uh, we are recording the session. I hope nobody has a problem with that. Um, if you could please leave your video off and your audio muted uh, because it helps with bandwidth. Um, and then if you have any questions as you think of them as we go through, just pop them onto the chat and then we'll look through them at the end. Uh, so um, just to uh, kick off then, I think in terms of uh, reopening, there are three things that you really need to, to look at doing. One is to be able to demonstrate that you're COVID-19 safe. Um, now, I have some insight into this. Not only do I have a, a professional background in uh, digital equipment, but also uh, in my spare time, I'm a volunteer flying instructor at um, a gliding club and also tug pilot. And we've had to go through this whole thing of uh, how do you actually reopen and try to make everything safe when people are going to be in close proximity and touching the same things. Uh, what they found on the, um, if you like, the, the process and procedure side was that they had too much information. They had information being thrown at them by the government, uh, by the Civil Aviation Authority, by the British Gliding Association, uh, British Microlight Association, um, and by half of the 150 members that we have. Uh, so one of the biggest things was just trying to sort the wheat from the chaff and trying to get a simple set of operating procedures and things like that. But that is all then documented. It's an 11 page document. Um, and there has been quite a lot of success in, in implementing that. And so some of the knowledge I'm gonna share with you today has come from the, the flying world, uh, as well as from the um, uh, world of uh, uh, digital equipment. I think the second thing you've really got to think about is public confidence because uh, we're all used to these uh, messages, usually after some disaster where people say uh, uh, health and safety is our primary concern and uh, our um, customers' data is of, of you know, great importance to us. And I think these things don't really wash. You know, the public want to be able to see that you are doing things, that you are following your own procedures and that you are keeping them safe. And the third thing is uh, the sustainability. And this is perhaps where we come in today is you you really need to do things that you can keep going in the long term uh, because it looks like this virus isn't going to go away for a long time and also i think public attitude has changed so um, the public are going to be much more demanding in the future of things looking to be hygienic um, there's a, the issue of cost inevitably if you do things that um, are not financially sustainable then you're not going to be able to keep them up anyway so um, in terms of what we're going to cover today, um, we'll look quickly at proximity. In other words, human led group tours. Um, we'll also look at uh, sanitization methods for different types of digital equipment. And then I'm going to spend a bit of time looking at bring your own device. Um, quite unashamedly, this is something that we do. We provide one of the, the methods of doing bring your own device. Uh, so I have a, a, a fully declared commercial interest in this. Um, but I think this is perhaps the period when bring your own device does come into its own. And then I've got a few case examples to show you and uh, we'll leave some time for Q&A at the end. Interesting, the picture you can see here is Creswell Crags. Uh, and I went, I've been on two visits there, one last year and um, you begin to see the nature of the problem that somewhere like that faces. And they are really suffering badly, Creswell Clugs. In fact, um, it's highly likely that they'll just shut and never reopen. Um, but you have a situation where uh, it's all group tours because you're going into Paleolithic caves that are otherwise the public is locked out of. Um, you are uh, inevitably confined together because you're in small caves. Um, the guide is having to speak quite loudly because people are quite a distance away from him. Uh, and also you're having to share all the um, safety equipment, the helmets and the lights and things like that. So it does throw up a massive set of problems. Um, as we're going through, I'm going to talk about three uh, types of cleaning. And it's worth just 
kind of uh, getting a definition of those because some of the terminology is a bit wishy-washy and some of it is used interchangeably. Um, first of all, uh, washing, normally we think of washing as removing something, you know, getting rid of dirt or something like that. Uh, but in the uh, context of COVID, um, it's a very specific way to disable the virus, and that is soapy water, which is a surfactant. It reduces the surface tension. So I guess you're probably all aware by now that uh, the COVID virus is really a collection of DNA surrounded by a sort of fatty lipid um, which uh, protects it. And soapy water uh, breaks down that fatty lipid protection. And so, as someone uh, rather eloquently said on the media, uh, the virus spills its guts in that case uh, and is, is therefore no longer active. Uh, you can't really kill a virus because it's not alive in that sense, but uh, it's, if you can break down the package that it's in, then it, it becomes ineffective. And soapy water is really good at that, which is why uh, all the advice to wash your hands and sing happy birthday. Um, we use it at the gliding club for wiping down things which wouldn't stand chemicals on them uh, and which people are not necessarily going to touch. Uh, so things like wiping down canopies and things like that. And we'll see the use of it as we go through here in a, a sort of a visitor context. Uh, the second thing is sanitising. I, I, I've done a bit of research on this to try to sort of um, uh, just educate myself as to exactly what these terms mean and you do see varying defi definitions but I think to put it simply sanitizing is something that's quick and good enough in other words it's instant um, and it gets rid of say 99% of the infection. Uh, disinfecting uh, I've seen in some definitions where they say it can only be called a disinfectant if it gets rid of 99.99% of uh, germs and bacteria. Um, but I think also disinfecting is the slower process. Um, it's where you leave the disinfectant around, it stays on the surface, so it's a kind of protective thing as well. So sanitising uh, in, in the coronavirus context is uh, done with denatured alcohol. What do we mean by denatured? Well, it's made so you can't drink it, uh, which also means the government won't tax it. So essentially, uh, Ethanol in particular is the stuff you would, you would drink for pleasure, um, but uh, it's also in its denatured form used uh, in sanitizer. It's mixed with water and the proportion is quite important. Um, below 50% the alcohol is likely to evaporate before it's broken down the virus's protective casing. So they're saying it should always be stronger than 50%. And uh, counterintuitively, you shouldn't use 100% uh, or really strong solutions. And the reason for that is that it tends to coagulate the proteins so that it actually kind of hardens them rather than breaking it down. Uh, so it coagulates the, yeah, the, the uh, lipid uh, shell. Um, if any of you have ever seen the experiment where you drop an egg in pure alcohol and it looks like it's been poached, it suddenly turns white, it's the same process. So normally they reckon around 70% seems to be, although there's disagreement on this, uh, but it seems to be 70% uh, solution is, is about the ideal. Uh, and either isopropyl alcohol or ethanol, uh, there are one or two other alcohols around that will, uh, will do it as well, but these are the main ones. And I put the warning there, the, the, the obvious thing is alcohol is, is flammable. So it's not a huge risk, but, um, in fact, it's not flammable, it would be explosive, I would guess, like petrol. So um, obviously what you don't want to be doing is, is sanitising 200 handheld audio guides um, in a cupboard somewhere, in an enclosed cupboard. Um, disinfecting is done with bleaching agents and that for coronavirus would normally be a chlorine-based bleach. Um, although you can, in theory, use ultraviolet light, that will also bleach. But obviously you've got to think about the exposure time and the intensity of the light. So it's a fairly technical way of doing it. Uh, but interestingly, um, one of the uh, heritage interpreters we work with has come up with, uh, uh, said they can have covers on their um, handheld audio guides that can be UV sanitized. So uh, that's obviously a bit of a new tech coming in to do that. The warning there is to beware of toxic fumes, uh, in particular 
uh, you do get ammonia bleach as well. Uh, and if you mix chlorine and ammonia together, you'll get a reaction and toxic fumes. So uh, you do need to be careful. Uh, at the gliding club, what we do is um, we use sanitizing as a thing that each pilot does before they get into the cockpit. So you sanitize all the things you're going to touch to your own satisfaction. And we'll see that in a visitor context a bit later on. Um, what we do as an end of the day procedure, particularly for the ground equipment that that's, tends to be a bit more tougher and a bit more agricultural, is we spray it round with a chlorine bleach, but we then leave windows and doors open so that the uh, the fumes can dissipate overnight. So, so that's a once a day, end of day procedure. Um, let's look at uh, the, the issues now, proximity and sharing. Um, one of the first things, it wasn't something I realised, I, I kind of realised when COVID came in that uh, there was going to be a problem with handheld devices and, and touch screens and things because the area we work in, but I never realised until we started getting inquiries that human led to us are a problem as well because people get uh, too close and the guide has, has got to shout. Um, one of the easy ways of uh, trying to overcome this is voice amplification and this um, device you see here, the uh, uh, speaker thing, you can buy, buy these for between about £15 and about £80. Uh, this is the kind of sort of top end of the range, uh, waterproof one. Uh, so that's a fairly simple uh, answer is have your people stand two metres apart and your guide uh, use some sort of speaker system like that. Um, and I was at a venue recently, they were obviously trying that out because there was a guy using one of these and testing it. Uh, another way is to use smartphone support is to put um, the subject matter of the tour onto the smartphone so people can read or see what you're talking about, see images and things like that. Um, and these guys at Rye Hope Museum are brilliant at that. They had an info point system office uh, with webcams for the, for the parts that people can't see. And they had these uh, three tablets you see them holding here. Uh, and uh, they make absolutely brilliant use of them, even when people are coming in and they're, they're talking to them because they're all volunteers, they're all, uh, it's, it's entirely volunteer run, uh, but they will use the tablets to show people particular things. And of course, the people can look at the same things on their, their own smartphone. And the other thing which is, is I think gonna receive a big boost now is um, live voice via smartphone. I did a bit of, uh, internet trawling and found that there are already some companies that offer this um, but without exception all the ones that are actually on the market require the visitor to download an app and install it before it will work. There is one bringing one out uh, is this company Vox um, and it sounds like it works very similar to our info points it's going to be a wi-fi based and it's going to work through a normal browser uh, I think using the technology called WebRTC, which we've now looked at uh, as something potentially we or others could install onto our info points. Uh, so the idea is that the uh, the guide, which I think is this lady in the middle, has a smartphone and talks into it. And the people around uh, just go to the appropriate page and they listen live on their smartphone while the voice is, is transmitted. So I think you've got to watch your space on this one. It's, it's not a technology that's been widely used before, but I can see it coming in quite quickly. Um, the ubiquitous handheld uh, tour guides, which of course have been around since the 1950s in, in various forms as audio guides and things like that. Um, the best method with those is uh, the isopropyl alcohol. Um, ideally the, the optimum 70% solution. And what I would suggest is brushing and wiping. One of the problems with these guides, as you can see here, is they've got lots of little crevices and things, uh, which will anyway tend to gather bits of skin and detritus. So um, I think the answer with these is to brush to get the uh, alcohol solution into the crevices uh, and then to wipe off excess. The alcohol will evaporate quickly, uh, you know, within a minute or two. So it's unlikely to damage the electronics it won't get inside. What it will do in terms of long-term exposure to the plastics, I don't know. I think it should be okay because of the fact that the alcohol evaporates completely. So you're only using alcohol and water. Um, but it, again, it depends on the type of plastic because there are many, many different types of plastic. Um, and my chemical knowledge is not good enough to know, uh, you know what might be affected by long-term exposure. Um, one of the things I'd put a little note at the bottom is just be careful with hand sanitizers tend to have all sorts of things in them uh, to make you smell nice, to make your skin soft and all the rest of it. And those things are obviously not going to be good to 
be putting on electronic equipment. So it really just wants to be the pure isopropyl alcohol um, uh, with ideally distilled water, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, the other possibility is to disinfect, but obviously bleaches are going to have a damaging effect um, on plastic, as will UV radiation normally. You might be able to get away with time and temperature. If you're in a museum, for example, that's only open one or two days a week, uh, if you can only use your devices once and leave them for a known period of time at a known temperature, um, say, you know, 48 hours uh, at, a, at a warm temperature, then you may well be able to, if you research it properly and, and make it a strict procedure, uh, you may well be able to say, well, that is sufficient sanitization. Um, touch screens and kiosks present a particular problem because people touch them randomly during the day. So I think as we've done with our pilots, bear in mind our pilots use uh, handheld radios and things like that, people on the field. Um, we've basically said everybody sanitizes the equipment before they use it. So uh, with the IPA spray and a microfiber cloth um, or with, with uh, uh, canopies, soapy water and things like this. And so we're making the, the user responsible for sanitizing to their own satisfaction. With touch screens, unfortunately, you can't really use chemicals on them because they're likely to damage the screen because they have an anti-reflection coating and also the touch sensitivity could potentially be affected. Uh, so it's the coatings that are the, the problem really rather than the screen itself. Um, so I think the only answer there is is the uh, cloth with soapy water uh, and doing them regularly. Um, the other thing to watch out for, again, we do see this at the gliding club, people go and get a, a paper towel off a roll uh, to clean a canopy. Um, you know, we have to stop them because uh, paper and paper-based products are very abrasive of anything like a screen. Uh, so you would never use those. Uh, and they come in various forms. I think you may have seen the J-cloths are called is a kind of proprietary name for some of them. They feel like a, a cloth. Uh, they look like a cloth, but they're not a cloth. They're actually paper-based. And most of the sanitizing wipes, baby wipes, things like that that you get are paper-based. So they're really not suitable for cleaning screens. The best thing is, is these microfiber cloths that you get nowadays. And the other big problem is interactive exhibits where people are going to touch and sit in and, and handle them. Again, I think the only answer is, is to give the user the means to sanitize them to their satisfaction before they use them. Uh, you could also adopt this thing of, of a light spray with a, a bleach uh, to disinfect them overnight, chlorine or something like that. But again, beware of the fumes. Um, there is the possibility, we'll see with the others, you can go to bring your own device. Um, we have got one example of one of our um, uh, heritage interpreter partners who's actually done bring your own device control uh, of an interactive. So it is possible to control interactives from your smartphone. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is the AR and VR. Um, now you do already have um, AR and VR um, uh, that you can do with bring your own device. And I'm going to show you an example of AR augmented reality uh, in the case examples at the end. Um, but what you could possibly do, rather than having um, devices that people share and have to sanitize each time, is you could get them to use their um, smartphone, but give them something like this Google Cardboard that you hold up to your eyes, which gives you the same effect as using kind of Oculus Rift uh, goggles. Um, some people have claimed that uh, the processing power is not sufficient to do the sort of swing your head round thing, but you've got all the accelerometers and things in uh, a, a mobile phone. Uh, so it should certainly be possible uh, to do the same sort of things that you would do um, with a, a headset. Uh, so I've talked about bring your own device quite a lot, and I, I think this is uh, maybe is going to be the age of the bring your own device. Uh, because of the, the pandemic. Uh, so if I just talk through what that means and what the different forms are. Um, first of all, look, just looking at it in a, as a generic thing, it avoids the hygiene issues. It also avoids capital costs because the user brings the device that they're going to use. They've bought it, they repair it, they update it. 
Uh, and also you've got a variable supply to meet the variable demand. And it is a problem with handheld guides. I know people I've talked to about replacing handheld guides with info points. Um, said the problem with them is on a busy day, we either don't have enough or we can't recharge them fast enough as people are going through. Um, and of course, the what what people tend to forget is is the device that your visitors bringing with them will support quite sophisticated audiovisual media. Uh, you can do interactive acts as well, and as we'll see, you can you can do augmented reality and potentially virtual reality. Uh, if you want to know how many people have got a smartphone, Ofcom do a survey every twelve months, and the twenty nineteen one I haven't updated it with the twenty twenty yet. Twenty nineteen one said that eighty percent of UK adults. Um, use a smartphone. And of course, among youngsters, it's even higher than that. So the chances are that any group of people visiting your um, your heritage site will have a smartphone somewhere between them. Um, on the downsides, um, they might not have a device or it might have a flat battery or something like that. Although I think that is, those two issues are just gradually getting less and less and less and will eventually just become insignificant. Um, a major thing that's a constant bugbear for us is that the user devices and the way they're configured will vary. Um, and it does mean that the goalposts move a little bit because the, the smartphone technology is moving so fast. Um, we've had to change a couple of times uh, the way that people connect to our info point units because the way that phones connect to Wi-Fi has changed slightly. So it is almost a sort of constantly moving thing. The, the big thing to remember is that if you, uh, if you own um, the device that you give to the visitor, you can make that device do anything it's physically capable of. If you go to bring your own device and you're going to use the visitor's smartphone, you have to restrict yourselves to things that every smartphone is capable of. Um, or if you offer anything beyond that, there's got to be a fallback that works on every phone. So lowest common denominator um, is, is the way to go. Uh, the other thing to remember, and all bring your own device, is that at some point you need connectivity, whether it's an app or web browsing or whatever you do, at some point you need a, a means to get the content onto the phone. Um, if we look at, um, I wanted to look at apps first of all, native apps. Um, one of the reasons for doing this is that when you talk to people about bring your own device and smartphones, they, they often assume you mean an app, um, because that's the thing with trained to think about. It's a familiar concept. Uh, they are consistent, they're fast, we all use them. Uh, and they can be clever and update themselves in the background as well. Uh, like the National Trust app, if any of you are familiar with that, it, when it's got Wi-Fi, it'll update the content. So you can get it out wherever you are and it will tell you what's on that weekend at places near to you. Now apps um, can be independent of the internet. They can work completely self-contained, but you've got to remember that to download and install an app, the user has got to have a good internet connection to do that. Um, and also your app has to be designed without any features that need the public internet. Uh, things like Google Maps, which is very easy for people to use, but that's not going to work unless the phone has got a good internet connection. And also um, the content that you can put on a self-contained app um, is going to be limited in size because the content itself will swell the size of the app. And we've been contacted by a number of, of professional heritage uh, providers, heritage interpreters, where the client has asked them for an app, so they've obliged, and then the client has asked them to put a lot of content on that app. And the app has just become too bloated uh, to be downloadable. Um, looking at the disadvantages side of apps, there is generally very poor visitor uptake, particularly for um, situations where uh, you're, you're looking at a, a single visit of a couple of hours. The visitors are not really prepared to download the app, especially not in advance of the visit, so you get very poor uptake. We normally say that apps need to be centered around the individual. Um, if it's something an individual is going to do regularly, uh, so if you're a member of the National Trust or English Heritage or whatever, um, if you do the, the same sort of activity, that app is going to serve you over a period of time. You're much more likely to download it and keep it updated and things like that. But you've also got to remember apps can be expensive both to create and to maintain. Now there are some platforms around, if you have an app designed from scratch by a developer, it's gonna be a lot of money. 
you know, 30, 40,000 pounds probably. There are platforms around which will enable you to develop apps, particularly sort of standard tour apps uh, for much less, usually on a, on a, a rental basis, on a you know, monthly subscription basis. Uh, but you've got to remember also that if your visitors are coming with different phones, you need to be able to provide you the experience on all of the platforms. So up till now, it's meant Apple, Android and Windows. We now have Hawaii because of all the very public problems with them. Uh, they've developed their own operating system as a rival to Android. And given the number of people in China or Africa or the, the BRIC countries, uh, it's not beyond the imagination that other operating systems will come out in the future. And you, you know, it's not right to say, um, well, we are, we're wheelchair accessible, um, but you can only do our virtual tour if you've got a, an Apple phone, for example. You know, that's, that's not accessibility. Uh, and you know, you've got to think about digital accessibility as well as physical accessibility. Um, I've made a note there that updates are driven by phone technology changes, which changes rapidly. You do have potentially poor design and vendor lock-in. And the example on the right here is a customer I went to see who actually told me they were disappointed in the app. And I downloaded it and did some research before I went to see them. Uh, and every time you run the app, it says it's checking for the latest content. So you watch this little wheel going round. Um, and then when it fails to connect to whatever server it's trying to connect to, that's it. You, you, you failed, <laughs> you stopped. Um, and it wasn't that I was offline here. You'll see that uh, uh, if you can see the very tiny Wi-Fi symbol there, I was, I was actually connected to the internet. It for some reason failed to, to find the servers it was looking for uh, and therefore gives up. So you have really a very poorly designed experience. Um, vendors can lock you in uh, to their, their particular, sorry, to their particular um, uh, technology so you need to be very very aware of that really it should be your content you should be in control of it um, and also you will need connection to the app store to download which means public uh, internet connectivity uh, something some people have asked on our info points you know could we put a downloadable app on and we have to say no because an awful lot of phones are locked to their uh, the phone manufacturers app store so they're not going to download an app from anywhere else um, I wanted just to look, because we've, we've talked about uh, connectivity uh, being a requirement for BYOD at the methods of connectivity. And I appreciate for some of you, I may be teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, but um, I've, I've come across people, particularly customers who um, thought that smartphones worked by satellite, you know, that they really didn't understand how the data got there. There are two uh, radios inside a phone. One type of radio will go to uh, your phone uh, phone service providers mast and then from that mast it goes by wire to the public internet okay so that's one way of getting connected we'll look at these three methods uh, in slightly more detail uh, after we look at this the second radio will connect to or radios type of radio if you like because there can be multiple ones will connect to a wi-fi signal um, that would be your broadband that you have to provide at your premises and uh, that in turn goes via wire to the public internet. So you've got two methods of getting to the public internet and browsing the web. The one that we sell is the uh, third type, which is the private internet. And although I say we sell it, um, you can also build it yourself. There's nothing uh, secret or proprietary about it. Um, anyone with the right knowledge could construct your own private internet uh, because it's internet is all standards driven and the standards and the technologies are all published. So how that works is the, the radio connects to a Wi-Fi as normal, but the Wi-Fi then is connected to a server um, that delivers a private internet. So it has all the uh, functionality of the internet. It works in exactly the same way. The phone thinks it's on the internet, but it's not actually on the public internet. It's just on your private internet. So just looking at some of the limitations, because if you're going to go bring your own device, you need to be aware of, of connectivity as a, as a critical factor. Um, the visitor's mobile data, for that to work, you've got to have a good signal on site from all providers. So you basically urban areas and things like this that would have that. Um, because it's no good saying, well, it works on my O2 phone if it doesn't then work on somebody's Virgin phone or something. You would need a 4G or higher service if you're going to do um, rich media like audio or video. The user will have to have their mobile data on, which I think most people do nowadays. And also they'll have to have a data allowance. A lot of people now do have unlimited data, uh, but there are still people on data plans which have 
a, a fixed limited amount of data. Um, and also bear in mind, if you have a lot of overseas visitors, they may be roaming, so their data may be limited and may be very expensive for them. In terms of public Wi-Fi, um, I, I think it's great. And if you've got public Wi-Fi, that is probably the way to go. You can put your tours and your um, apps and things like that as web apps. So I made a note at the bottom here. Uh, with public Wi-Fi, you've got the option of either native apps that people install and they could install them while they're on your site because you've got uh, a good broadband access or you can run web apps on the public uh, internet. Uh, so uh, lingering in the cafe, some people see that positive or negative. Um, one of the things you do need to be aware of is you've got to have professionally configured uh, Wi-Fi because otherwise you leave yourself out potential IT security issues. Um, things like uh, schools visits, uh, you need to think about child protection because you don't want people um, surfing unsavory content on your internet. And also there is actually some legislation that says you should collect people's details when you give them internet access. And it's basically anti-criminality and particularly anti-terrorism legislation. You don't want somebody uh, planning a terrorist plot uh, behind the protection of your internet. Um, you may get young people particularly, oops, sorry, I keep clicking this and it goes forwards. You may get young people bandwidth hogging because people, once you give them public internet access, unless you block certain services, which is part of, again, of the professional setup, um, they'll stream their Spotify to listen to music while they're walking around or whatever, which may take up your bandwidth. Um, but on the beauty side, you can add all sorts of external facilities. So you can link to Google Maps. Uh, you can have links to your own public website from within your interpretation. Um, and of course, you can update remotely because you can update from anywhere across the public internet. The private, uh, what I call intranet uh, solution that we provide, um, the, the particular characteristic of that is it can be used anywhere. Uh, because you, it's not only bring your own device, you are actually bringing your own internet. Um, and that includes outreach because it can be battery operated. So it can, it can go where there's uh, no mains power and things like that. Uh, one of the things that, again, we didn't realize when we first started this, but um, customers have said to us is we like it because it's exclusive to site visitors. People can't sit and do the tour at home. They have to come on site. And in cases where there's a ticket price, they have to come through the ticket gate to use the uh, facilities. Uh, downside is you can only update on site. Uh, we have a number of customers say, why do I have to sit in my drafty church or my um, wave washed pier to update it? But, but essentially you've got to be within range of the info point to actually uh, manage its content. Uh, but of course you can take it home. It's a small box. You can uh, uh, take it home and do it in the comfort of your home or your office. Um, it is intrinsically secure because it's not on the public internet uh, and it can be made physically secure because it can be put somewhere where the visitor can't see it or touch it. It's safe for children. It's effectively a kind of walled garden. Uh, it is consistently fast because um, you're not having to rely on the infinite internet infrastructure uh, and sort of subsequent hops across servers there. It literally goes from the Wi-Fi to, the, to your server and from your server back to the Wi-Fi. Uh, you can put any number of independent websites on it because it's not a website, it is an internet and you can put, uh, you can host on there websites for all sorts of people. So that's good for sort of hosting community things um, or for things like landscape partnerships where you've got multiple partners who want to manage their own content independently of each other. You can put any kind of audio visual media on it and uh, as we said, you can put interactive apps, including AR and VR. Um, in terms of help and funding, um, there are a lot of very clever interpreters around. We work with quite a few of them and um, they can help you in an enormous amount in terms of getting good interpretation, sensitive interpretation. Um, and many of them have a really good and deep technical understanding. Um, and we work with a lot of them. The, I, think I would say, you know, members of the Association of Heritage Interpreters, which is the professional body, um, are the people who really take this seriously as a profession. So I, we generally uh, do say to people that unless you're confident doing your own content, um, it's really good to, to turn to someone uh, to help to tell your story. 
Uh, the other point here is the emergency funding, and this does now seem to be being thrown at people. These things I've sort of put here have all come in since I've been writing this uh, presentation. Uh, this one you'll see is Monday 17th of August. Um, so uh, National Lottery, um, Heritage England, um, AIM, the Association of Independent Museums, um, I think Historic Religious Buildings Association, all of these people um, are um, being having emergency funding channeled through them, uh, which can be used to reopen. And one of the issues that you could approach them for funding is that you need to change um, your guiding or your um, you know devices that people touch and things like this. In other words, you need to do something digital to um, to help you to get back open and get back into business. Um, you can generally repurpose existing content with Bring Your Own Device because uh, most things will move onto the smartphone environment. And while you're doing that, you can think about updating it, modernizing it, particularly think about things like accessibility, um, inclusivity of LGBTQ, things like that, Black Lives Matter. Uh, there's an awful lot that can be done whilst you're porting content across. Um, uh, this example here from St. Swithin's, uh, they already had um, printed leaflets and the designer had those as uh, PDFs. So they were able to be just put on as electronic PDFs. And I've just made a note there of some issues you may need to think about um, in terms of porting content over. The one I'd just like to look at is formats. Um, and I would say this is good general advice in any sort of content you're doing is stick to standard formats. And I've, I've listed there for the different types, uh, the various kinds. Um, video is the only one that has any complexity about it. Um, you need to think about the, uh, the file type and the codec, which is the H.264 there. And also you need to think about some other things about size and definition and um, frame rates and um, bit rates and things like that. So um, video does tend to have a, a bit more complexity about it. But somebody who's used to doing video for mobile devices is going to know all that stuff and be able to uh, normally video at high, super high quality and then produce effectively sort of uh, prints or copies that are at the, the right sort of specification for a mobile device. Um, OK, uh, what I'm going to do now is just quickly go through some examples. I just want to look on the participants list to see um, if Nigel is here from, no, he's not, is he? I, know, I thought Nigel might just uh, come along and talk about his uh, thing. So um, some practical case examples. Um, the first one is, is a church, historic parish church. Um, uh, they've got national lottery heritage funding and um, they had a team of volunteers who you see there in the picture and one designer who's the guy just to the left of the, uh, the uh, sign. And um, they did a whole load of stuff. They put tours and trails on. They have an info point in the church and one in the village hall. So you can do village trails starting by just parking your car outside the village hall on the road. You can download the trails. Um, there's interactives for kids like the jigsaw here. There's a scratch off of the, the church windows. Um, and they also have got um, separate community spaces uh, that they can host people like guides or scouts or the history group, I think in this case, they're hosting um, on their own uh, device. So it's been a great success. I really loved it. Um, uh, they put all their own content on and they manage all their own content. Um, the one that um, Nigel, who's from uh, Fuzzy Duck in Manchester, um, they recently did this interpretation for the RAF Memorial at Runnymede. Um, a very strange sort of quiet, solemn place. Um, it's a memorial rather than a graveyard. Um, and um, what they did was developed an interactive app. So you, you basically interact with things like the map or these things, and you, you go through uh, the experiences of this lady, Noor Khan, uh, during the Second World War. So a really lovely story. Um, it's told in a lovely way. It's highly interactive and highly exploratory. Um, and it sits nicely in the, um, the sort of the ambience, the sense of place uh, of Runnymede. Um, I think uh, Max is in fact here from Commonwealth War Graves. I might uh, bring you in at the end, Max, during the, during the Q&A. Um, uh, they're also putting it in at Tietval in France, uh, but that's got held up by the, uh, the whole coronavirus thing. So that kit is still uh, in my workshop waiting to go. Um, 
another example, um, again, a church, this is a Catholic church at Lowestoft uh, in a fairly busy, fairly aggressive urban environment. Um, and they had um, professional interpreters. This was uh, University of York uh, Center for the Study of Christianity and Culture. And what they created was a series of trails. Uh, but the thing I really like is this augmented reality. So this is a 360 panorama that you drag around with your finger. And when you click on the I buttons, it gives you uh, information about the objects. And the real nice thing about this is, um, although the University of York did the panorama and set everything up and delivered the thing complete and working, um, the information buttons come from a content management system, which the customer has control over. So the church itself can update the information and the objects over time. Uh, there's also the, the nest cam for kitty wakes, uh, because they have kitty wakes nesting in the tower. Um, so you can see um, either live or recorded highlights of the uh, kitty wakes. Uh, they also had three tablets which they make available to the guides or to visitors if they want to loan them to them. You, again, you're going to get sanitation issues with that, but um, because these are meant to be sort of outdoor things and they're in rugged cases, um, they can be wiped down with uh, isopropyl alcohol to sanitise them between every use. Um, other sexy stuff you can do is um, things like location triggering. So this one is from um, uh, National Trust of Petworth, which was done by ATS Heritage. Uh, you can include QR codes, uh, NFC tags, one on the left, and also the, the um, Bluetooth low energy beacons and things like that. So you can do all kinds of things that um, will give people stories that relate to where they are, orientate them to where they are. Um, uh, they all work with uh, with web technology um, and you know in the case of our info points that's why we stick with standard web technology so uh, we can do all these sort of things and the the really uh, sexy final bit which is um, Simon from uh, Ugly Studios um, has a again it's an installation that was due to go in in April uh, got held up by the COVID thing and and as yet still isn't in uh, but they may put it in by the end of the year and he's developed something whereby you can control interactive apps uh, from your phone and, and you can have kind of collaborative games and things like that that the visitors can do. But it, it's all controlled from your own phone. Um, it's a little bit under wraps. Um, he, I did actually have to ask him if it was OK to talk about this because it's it's something absolutely I've never seen anybody doing this before. Um, but again, I think in the long term, this may be where the future goes is um, using the capabilities that are already fundamentally there in in smartphone technology. Um, to enable the visitor to, to not only um, see and hear your content, but also to control aspects of their visit. Um, quick advertisement from the authors of this uh, very good book, um, available from all good booksellers uh, and on Amazon. Uh, Paul and I wrote a book about uh, digital interpretation, trying to sort of demystify it. So it's, it's very much a non-technical guide um, to how you can use mobile phone technology within a, a heritage context. Uh, with that, we can move on to the Q&A. So, um, I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen and then just have a look at the um, the questions. Uh, oh, I've not got any yet. Well, I thought I thought we'd have a, a, a shed load of them. So should I then, if I unmute everyone, uh, and we'll we'll kind of take a risk and see if uh, uh, if we can all speak. If I unmute all. If it all goes horribly wrong, I'll just mute everybody again. But um, has anybody got any any questions they they would like to ask? Uh, I think the unmuting hasn't worked for everyone, has it? So let's try it again. That looked better. It still hasn't done everyone, so I may have to go through and. And do you all? Do you want me to do it? Uh, yeah, if you try, if you will, Barry, please. Thanks. Uh, let's say ask to unmute. People can people can unmute themselves, I think. Yes. Yeah, they can if they wish to. I um, got a little box up on my screen to click when you first unmuted us. Ah, uh, okay. 
half are and half aren't. <coughs> uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so I think I have set it so you can unmute yourselves. So uh, uh, hopefully, if you if you've got a question to ask, then uh, by all means, uh, uh, either pop it on the chat or uh, just unmute yourself and ask away. So I was just wondering about costs um, and especially either transferring existing content onto bring your own devices or going for bring your own device um, from the beginning of a project inception and whether that makes things more expensive or not. Um, it, it, it's a very good question actually. It's um, very much how long is a piece of string. Um, in terms of um, converting content, if you've got uh, fairly standard content, it should convert pretty easily, really, um, over to bring your own device. Um, if you, I mean, our, our units are 2,800 pounds for a master unit, so, so they're not that expensive. Um, there are, I've seen some app platforms that advertise, I think about one and a half thousand a year um, but I've also known apps kind of be like 15, 20, 30,000. Um, so I, th I think a lot depends on your brief, you know, structuring your brief. Um, it, it, I mean, in terms of the range of, of costs we have from, from somebody buying one info point doing it themselves, they, they will spend 2,800 plus fat. Um, a typical bigger project where they use a network and they maybe have a webcam or something like that might come out of 15 to 20,000. That's, that's probably the biggest that we do, but we don't do content. So um, uh, we will do sort of technical support and some structuring and things like that, but uh, we very strictly keep away from, from authoring content or creating new content. Um, I, I just find that trying to set the briefs with a realistic um, budget quite difficult because budgets literally seem to range, you know, from start from scratch, from anything from 10,000 to 150,000. Um, and you're right, it's how long's a piece of string, but it's very hard to know sometimes whether you're being taken for a bit of a ride with developers. Yeah, I, I suppose one thing you could do is start with the money <laughs> and say, right, I've, I've got this to spend. Tell mm -hmm. me what you would do for that. Um, it, uh, yeah, I think sometimes you, you do get overkill and you do get a situation where developers, uh, they want to do the latest sexy thing. And if their clients will finance that as great. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I think one of the problems with apps is that you get a lot of developers who are not particularly heritage interpreters, um, uh, you know, and, and don't really have the sort of storytelling capabilities uh, who might be cheap, but are quite likely to produce a pretty poor app. So I suppose you, there's also that you get what you what you pay for sort of thing. But but I, I think I mean, I have a bit of a sort of uh, background in the advertising design world and um, uh, the thing there everything kind of revolves around the brief you know if you specify in the brief uh, but I say it's difficult if you're not expert uh, to uh, to draw up a detailed brief but uh, uh, you I, I think you're quite welcome to start with the money <laughs> and say well <laughs> tell me exactly in detail what you would do for this you know that's it we think is a reasonable budget thank you you're welcome is uh Max, did you, uh, uh, I noticed you came in, which I was surprised because you're actually a customer. Uh, <laughs> say anything? Um, well, thank you very much for the talk, first of all. That was re really, really interesting and uh, very useful, uh, considering that uh, obviously we're, we're all moving into our new normal, which will be dealing with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, to a certain extent, I feel very lucky uh, compared to what I imagine most people. Uh, because uh, all the problems that the Commission, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, faced of all of our sites being isolated, a long way away from everything, no power, no uh, no easy access. Uh, I suppose the easy access stuff hasn't gone away, but uh, suddenly we're in a position where uh, being far away and lots of space um, uh, is an advantage for us, because um, obviously people can, can visit and spread out and uh, uh, be, uh, be be able to uh, not be uh, close to one another, be able to social distance. Um, I'm, uh, noticed a number of questions that have, have come up and one of them uh, which I think is, is really useful for, for me as a 
somebody who's working with you at the moment um, to answer is the question about power source uh, and housing of the info point boxes which uh, which you provide uh, for providing intranet. Um, we obviously have to think very carefully about this at the Commission. Uh, we're installing info point boxes um, at uh, the Thiet Val Memorial on the Somme in France. Uh, there was no possibility of putting in power cables um, uh, and we had to think carefully about uh, where we would house them because we couldn't put them in a ceiling, for example, to hide them away because there are no ceilings, it's uh, outside. Um, and so we've built uh, solar panel boxes uh, and the boxes uh, have the info point um, transmitter inside it uh, and then solar panels uh, on top so they are there uh, and a battery and um, solar powers power the battery and the, uh, the info point boxes uh, draw their power off those and it's uh, an elegant solution uh, we think to um, uh, being both environmentally friendly and providing an engaging experience for visitors uh, to, uh, to our memorial uh, and it, it works very well uh, for us and we're looking forward to uh, testing it out in September where it will all be perfectly smooth and everything will work very well. Yeah, fingers, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed for that. Yeah. Thanks for that. I'd, I'd forgotten to mention solar power yeah, as, as, as an option of course uh, and of course the device is powered by battery. Yeah, the person's own device is powered by batteries and the info points you can either solar power them permanently or uh, you can power them with a little um, pocket-sized lithium-ion battery if you're only going to use them for an event or for outreach or something. So, so I, yeah, think thanks, that, thanks I think that answers uh, Rowan's question um, that he put in the chat about uh, requirements for housing and the uh, power source. So I hope that answers that, yeah, uh, yeah. Rowan. Yeah, and certainly outdoor. Um, yeah, a lot of our installations are outdoors, so so yeah, Commonwealth War Graves and uh, um, Swanage Pier and things. And another point, Max, as well, which is really useful, is I had a customer who wanted to look at one of our installations. I said, well, he's in London. I said, we've got Tower, Tower of London and the Wellington, uh, both of which are you know, closed at the moment. And then I checked on the Runnymede website and they said it was open. So obviously, because you can socially distance there, so right, yeah. there's no staff and everything. So that was really useful. I was able to say to him, yeah, if you get yourself out to Heathrow, you can go and go and look at that. Um, there's a question here from Louise Fletcher um, about um, how long term these solutions are, uh, whether this solution will become redundant or change this behaviors which aren't desirable uh, as long term change in regards to COVID. Yeah. I, th I think it, almost nobody knows about the future, but uh, one of the things we, one of the views we take with technology is you really want to look at sort of 10 year horizon. And it is a problem with a lot of things. I've come across um, Bluetooth installations, and this is the old Bluetooth before Bluetooth low energy, that, that lasted a couple of years and then the whole of the phone technology moved on. So you've got a major issue there uh, with technology changing. So we generally say to people, you don't want to be reliant on something that's a feature of a device, you know, a feature of a piece of hardware. And it's one of the reasons we stick with absolutely bog standard web technology is that that only moves very, very slowly forwards and is always backward compatible because you've got, I think it's six, no, three and a half billion uh, internet users around the world. So if you suddenly move the technology so it doesn't work on old devices, you're going to going to disenfranchise all those people. So and it, it would be madness to produce a, say, a new a new type of smartphone um, with a different operating system that wouldn't allow you to go onto the public web through a Wi-Fi. So. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. The visitor behaviour thing is really interesting. Um, it was an issue for, for Runnymede and it is for a number of churches and things. In fact, Barry and I were just talking about that this morning in the context of another church. Um, things like audio can be quite disturbing. Um, and I even had it, I went to one outdoor site, a woodland site, and they uh, were testing it and they were, they were doing something. And they actually said, oh, that's interesting because we're all testing standing around, but we can hear each other testing. And they said, we wouldn't want to do that. We would actually want silent videos. So you would want probably subtitles or something on the videos uh, because you don't want people standing in that spot um, of broadcasting sound. Um, and I think there is this issue, which is, which is really for the heritage interpreters rather than us, we just provide the device, the hardware platform, but um, there is this issue about how to get a sense of place. Uh, you know, many of the, of the places that we visage, that people visit as heritage sites, um, th there, there is something about them that is quiet, contemplative and thoughtful. 
and you don't necessarily want jazzy interpretation. So, um, and I think th there's also the issue, will people want to look at their phones? There was an interesting bit of research done at um, uh, Hardwick Hall, where they said that um, they were quite surprised that they, the 60s and over group, you know, the, the T and brogues and things like this uh, set were, were quite willingly using their phones and going, oh, this is great. Um, and some of the younger people were saying, oh, we don't want to get the phone out. I look at that all day, every day. I would, I really want the sort of physical experience. So um, I, I think that it is a question of how you plan your interpretation and, and you know, what people can do uh, with it. Um, I don't think it's automatic, but I do think the, um, the move towards sanitization, uh, you know, and, and, and if you like sort of infection consciousness is probably going to be ingrained in our population now for many years to come. And it's interesting, they say that, that um, they're expecting you know, normal uh, flu and colds and things mm. to drop. And that I think the, the excess death rate, isn't it? This sort of normal death rate has dropped below the average. And they think that's because everybody is being super conscious about sanitization. I know I am. I, you know, I suppose in the past, I wouldn't have washed my hands when I did something like come in from outside, got back from the shops or something. And now I do. <laughs> you know, so, mm. so you're very, very conscious of doing this regularly. As a question from Lizzie, um, uh, Neil, and it's, you've part answered it really. And she's concerned about people staring at their screens and not enjoying the uh, environment so much. So you might want to uh, expand on that. And, I can and come back on that, that a little bit if you like, because we've, we've dealt with exactly this issue because of course, our, we don't want people to be you know, glued to a phone. Yeah. Um, uh, when they're walking around our site. I mean, for TFO in particular, um, we're putting the info point system in, uh, or the reason why we initially put the info point system in was because the memorial was going to be closed. And so providing interpretation like this maintained uh, a reason for people to want to come and see and discover. But uh, the key thing is that the info point system allows you to put in interpretation that can then encourage you to discover more about the site. You don't have to put everything in the app it can encourage you to go and find things to go and see things in ways that you and learn more about them in ways that you can't do with putting up a panel um, and these kinds of things so for example we put in um, interactive maps which encourage you to go wander the site see elements of the site that you wouldn't have normally seen um, and the info point system in boxes um, allows us to have a strong Wi-Fi signal across the entire site, not just at an entrance, for example, um, where people can, uh, can people can access it across the whole site and see the whole thing. Um, if that if that's helpful, that's what that's what we have done. Thank you. Yeah, great. That's great. Uh, I hope that answers Lizzie's question. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. It, it is a big subject. I think it's a good subject. Um, just quickly to ask to answer Annette from Howarth. Um, the, I, what I would say you would have available for sanitization, I think, which is fairly safe, is, is, is a 50 to 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol mix in spray bottles with um, uh, microfiber cloths and a bin to put them in afterwards so that people can, can take the bottle and the cloth, sanitize to their, to their own satisfaction, and then drop the cloth in a bin. Uh, this is what we do at the gliding club. So the, the pilots are, are each responsible for sanitizing their own aircraft before they fly it. Um, but the kit is, is, is all around. There's bottles all over the place um, uh, and soapy water as well uh, and buckets of soapy water to wash your hands in. So if you've pushed a glider or something that other people are going to push, the idea is as you get back to the launch point, you, you rinse your hands in the soapy water. Um, but the, uh, apart from the slight fire risk, uh, which I say, I don't want to overemphasize that, but it, it is there. Um, I, I think isopropyl alcohol spray, it, it smells sort of clinically as well, I find. You, you kind of, you, you feel as if something is, is, is more hygienic afterwards. Um, and the fact that the, the, um, the stuff evaporates very quickly, uh, the, you know, the alcohol goes very, very fast. Um, so it doesn't leave things damp or, or sticky or that. So, um, yeah, microfiber cloths not expensive, I and mean, you can get them from you. You I tend to buy big bulk uh, ones, you know, just off Amazon or something. But you can get them from uh, all sorts of you know hardware shops and supermarkets and things like that. Buy buy a batch of them. I don't know what you would pay for them, two or three quid for a packet, a small packet of them or something like that. Uh, but I think if you buy them off Amazon or somewhere in in bulk, uh, then then they're far cheaper. Um, 
and you can wash them of course you know they're, they're washable reusable uh and that's so um smart of a few objects yeah great i think um what Kathy Cruikshank saying here, it, it kind of fits in with what I'm seeing is that um, you are getting people saying, well, okay, we'll host stuff on site. Um, and then you, you know, in the long term, probably will pay a rental or something like that to have so many objects on it that people can access. You've just got to think about the fact that um, your visitor will need to have uh, public internet access constantly while they're walking around. I think if you can do that through Wi-Fi and your own broadband, that's okay. I think relying on the phone signal is generally pretty dodgy because it's got to be across all the providers. Um, they do change. I know uh, Barry's son had a problem that somebody near them, uh, a building burnt down, the uh, phone provider took the mast away or the fire took the mast away, but they didn't replace it. And that means you lose uh, connectivity through that provider. And also you've got to think about the sort of environment you're in. If you're in a transport museum with a steel clad building, you're not going to get any phone signal inside. And equally inside a castle with thick damp walls, there's quite a lot. Um, uh, it's, it, there's quite a sort of black art really to um, radio propagation, whether it's uh, mobile phone or, or um, Wi-Fi. Um, there's things you can do to improve it and there's buildings that really are extremely awkward uh, to do it in. Underground bunkers is another one. Uh, if you put the antenna inside it works really well because they're what they call a the Faraday cage, they're uh, reinforced with iron bars. So uh, you, you don't necessarily get the effects you're expecting. Um, and we found um, Swanage Pier piers are a, an issue. Uh, because we'd, we've done one and uh, Barry knows because <laughs> he, yeah, he, he was the one the testing it. Um, yes. So yeah, the, the, uh, we think what that is, is it's the surface of the water. There's a reflection off the surface of the water. So a lake or a pond uh, is great because the, the signal will skip off, uh, but um, the surface of the sea, because it's so rough and changeable, uh, tends to give you multiplast signals and things. So um, so yeah, I think that that's the only problem there. You've got if you're going to go BYOD, whichever way you're going to do it, you've got to ensure that the visitor has connectivity, you know, good connectivity, uh, in order to be able to use it. You might add that we did uh, solve the problem at the pier. <laughs> yeah, although it was it was it was in the end a brute force solution is is just yes. to put additional access points, so you're never more than thirty meters from an antenna, you know. So yeah. uh, uh, whereas one one antenna should really have covered that distance easily, uh, it should yeah. have should have eaten it. Um, in the end, we needed to use three antennas. The, the other thing as well, caves, um, you can use a thing called leaky antenna. Uh, so you can put it along something like a cave or an underground passageway or something like that um, so that the signal leaks out along its length. Um, that was another solution we did think of for Swanage, but it was too expensive to run a cable underneath the whole pier. Um, but yeah, that, that is going to be your thing with, with bring your own devices. You, 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 you then do have to realize you've got to have internet access. Whereas with the old fashioned sort of handheld devices that you hand out, everything is self-contained within them. Um, and so, you know, they work without any sort of external uh, help at all. So. Great, has, has anybody got any other questions they'd like to ask before we close? We just, we've just ever run the, the six o'clock, so. I'd just like to ask a quick question, please, Neil. And um, yeah, thanks for that, that was really interesting. And um, so assuming good connectivity to Wi-Fi, which isn't a given across some of our sites, but assuming we have it, um, QR codes, are they like the, the go-to for free access, for example? So we don't have NFC tags. I'm looking to kind of do some trial projects to convince yeah. some people okay. that you okay. know, we can do this. I'll try and explain this very quickly in a couple of minutes, um, but we may well run a separate webinar on this because it's 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 a big thing. Um, NFC tags and QR codes um, fundamentally both do the same thing. They give the phone, um, in our case, a URL to go to. Uh, it begins HTTP and the phone knows that's a web page. So uh, you can use QR codes, you can use them natively with our info points, or if the visitor's connected to the public internet, uh, they will just work straight away. Um, QR codes are sort of universal, providing the user's got a QR code reader app of some description on their phone. 
NFC tags, the person needs to have an NFC enabled phone and needs to have it switched on. We think that's going to be far more common nowadays with the Apple Pay and all these kind of things. Apple did originally lock NFC down, uh, but now modern Apple devices, the newer ones, uh, have the NFC opened up. Um, the, the beauty of those two systems is they cost very little to put in. Um, you can also use NFC and QR codes to connect people to Wi-Fi as well. So uh, that's, that's another way of, of very easily getting people into your, your content. Bluetooth low energy, I have a bit of a down run for a number of reasons. One, um, it uh, needs a battery to operate, and that means it's not going to operate in sub-zero temperatures outdoors. You're going to have to change the battery probably at least once a year. Um, I've experimented with some, and um, they do, when the battery runs down, they do maintain their memory, which is quite good. So, so I can take the battery out, and then when I go and do a demo, I can put the battery in, and it's, and it's there working. It's still programmed. Uh, but yeah, by all means, experiment with those. I think the thing to see them as is an alternative. Give people an easy way to get to the content manually. Um, but I think increasingly, people will be more comfortable with QR codes and with NFC tags, especially young people. You know, they're, they're used to it. And the people growing up with, uh, you know, pay by using your smartphone, they are they're going to have it switched on on their phone because it needs to be on all the time because NFC, well, NFC does, NFC is a broadcast system. So the phone broadcasts um, a radio signal uh, and the NFC tag actually takes its power from the radio signal. Um, so the NFC tag doesn't need batteries in it, it'll work in sub-zero temperatures, it's really just a chip and a, and a big aerial. And the aerial captures radio waves, uses those to power the chip, and the chip then sends out, um, in our case, a, um, a URL. It can send other things, it can just send a number or text or whatever, but the phone will interpret that depending on, on what it is. So if it, if it says 01664, the phone will say that's a phone number. But if it begins with HTTP, the phone will say that's a web page that you want me to go to, to, to there. Uh, so they are great. I think they're going to become increasingly used and increasingly common. The one I have the down on is, is Bluetooth Low Energy. And, and to sort of finish on a, on a COVID-related theme, when the government said they were going to do a contact tracing app using Bluetooth low energy between phones, I turned to my wife and said, it's not going to work. <laughs> and one of the reasons is that um, although signal strength does correlate to how close two things are together, two antennas, it's not the only factor. We've talked about, you know, the metal transport shed. Um, if two people uh, had a contact tracing app and they were both in the same uh, transport museum, um, they could be miles away from each other and, and the well, yeah, hundreds of meters away from each other. And the app will say, I was close to this person. And equally, if you're, if you're in a damp castle or something, you could be quite close to someone. Uh, but if you're both close to two damp walls, um, you're going to get sort of half the signal strength that you would do. So um, there are all kinds of problems with, with um, Bluetooth low energy, depending on what on your application. But I think um, NFC and, and QR codes yeah, yeah, they're reliable. They do what they say on the tin, and uh, um, I think they'll become increasingly popular. And they're cheap and easy to produce and change. One of the things that you might think of doing, which is what we do on InfoPoint, is we send the QR code to an alias, and the alias then sends the user to the final destination. The beauty of that is, if you've printed the QR code on a big sign or something like that, and you decide you want it to point to somewhere else, or you want to change it seasonally to point to a different location, you can just go in and reprogram the alias address rather than having to reprint the whole QR code and, or reburn the NFC tag or whatever. But yeah, they are, they are great. So and finally, if I finish on the last question, Karen has, has very kindly led me to, to, uh, to a closing question. How do we access a recording of this? Um, after this is finished, the system should send me a, a recording. And what I'll do, I'll probably top and tail it just to, to cut it down. And uh, we'll, we'll then put it on our website on the homepage under the COVID warning. But I'll send an email out to everyone with a link. Um, so, because I have got several requests from people who couldn't make it tonight, but uh, uh, wanted to see a recording. So thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, it's great. It's been some interesting questions, which I, I will uh, save and uh, think about further as well. And um, I hope you're all staying well and safe and uh, continue to do so. And uh, we will uh, doubtless uh, cross paths at some point in, in the future. And if anybody has any further questions, do, uh, do please feel free to drop me a line and 
I will, it will answer what I can. So thanks very much. Thanks to my colleague Barry for your help and, uh, sure. and to Max for the advertisement. So, uh, and uh, I hope to see you all again soon. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Neil.